Hello and welcome to this interesting Sunday edition of World Series News. I'm calling it Trump 48. And as many of us know, after the uh, fantastic week that we've just lived through, Donald Trump has been elected president to be the 47th president of the United States. And we're all very excited to see that at long last, the establishment has been turned on its head and the mainstream media has been exposed to not only not have the power it once thought it did, but to be caught out for every single lie it's told that it is no more than a propaganda apparatus of the deep state. So everything we've thought, everything we've known, has effectively come true. However, we're in this very unique position now that Donald Trump doesn't become officially the 47th president of the United States until after the Electoral College meets and his inauguration in late January of 2025. So I want you to hold that thought for just a moment because this story goes back, well, to 2007, if you will, where it becomes a little bit personal let me tell you all about it. And it starts here in Australia. Well, here it goes. In fact, even earlier, a friend of mine introduced me to a book. This book was called First Abolish the Customer, 202 Arguments Against Economic Rationalism. And it was written by Bob Ellis. Bob Ellis is, of course, or was a uh, famous author, filmmaker, screenwriter and speechwriter for many, many Labor stalwarts, all the way up to multiple prime ministers. And he was, in fact, himself a candidate to run for the Labor Party in the North Shore of New South Wales. Well, Bob Ellis was, for mine, for some time, a little bit of a hero of mine. I really look up to him. He did everything that I wanted to do. There he was. He was, as I said, he was a screenwriter, a filmmaker. He was part of the Labor Party. He even wrote speeches for some of the greats in the Labor movement, including Gough Whitlam, Kevin Rudd, Kim Beasley, Bob Hawke, etc. So when you get the opportunity to attend a New South Wales state conference and you just happen to cross paths with Bob Ellis, what does a young up-and-comer in the Labor Party do? Well, he walks straight up to him, introduces himself and asks him a question here about how he came up with the idea to write such a book. Well, everyone who loves to talk about what they've written about, don't they? So Bob Ellis and I started a discussion that went for almost two hours outside the big hall at the old Darling Harbour, where I realised that a Labor Party state conference was nothing more than a rubber stamp exercise. You see, I was a member of the Quakers Hill branch and of the seat of Greenway for the Labor movement somewhere between the years of 2005 and 2008. And I actually decided to join the party after Mark Latham, the then leader, recruited Peter Garrett, lead singer of Midnight Earl, a band that I'd adored over the years, and over a Thai takeaway meal, Mark Latham convinced Peter Garrett to join the Labor movement. And of course, Peter Garrett went on to get elected and three years later in the Rudd government became a, well, a faulty minister, if you will, of the arts and the environment. And of course, was the uh, scapegoat for the horrific pink bat scheme that was part of the GFC recovery movement led by Kevin Rudd. Well, put all that aside, I get to meet Bob Ellis at this particular occasion and ask him a bunch of questions. I even went and had lunch with him and we had a steak sandwich and a bottle of wine. In that lunch, I asked him, out of everyone you know in the Labor movement, who's the smartest? Was it Gough Whitlam? Was it Paul Keating, Bob Hawke or Kevin Rudd? And he looked at me and he said, it's none of them. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's Kim Beasley. He says, you can put Kim Beasley in a room and he can talk about anything for four hours and you're never, ever bored. I said, but what about Goff? He said, ah, oh, you know Goff. Goff, you go and watch him start up in a blaze of glory. You walk out, you return an hour later for the summary. That's Goff Whitlam, he said. Well, as a young bloke trying to make his way in politics, I was impressed. 
and thought this is a pretty cool thing to do to have lunch with Bob Ellis. Well, unfortunately, there's another side to the story. But here's the big part. I asked him specifically in 2007, this is before Barack Obama was to be elected president, and while Hillary Clinton was still in the mix, I said, what do you think about Obama? And his response to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, with his glasses down here, always hanging off a, a string around his neck, looking grotty. He had, a, he had a tie and a jacket that was a bit loose and daggy. His hair was all over the place. And he said to me, Barack Obama gave a speech the other day that was 17 times better than the Gettysburg Address. Well, I too had seen that speech and was equally impressed by Obama. So we certainly had something in common. Then, of course, he went on to ask me, what time's lunch? I said, well, it looks like everyone's walking out of this uh, particular conference that all they do is give you a big book and tell you at the bottom of each different thing that they're going to suggest is going to be part of Labor policy. You either vote yes to this or you vote no to that. So there's no debate at the Labor Party State Conference. You simply do as what head office tells you to do. That's why I was outside. And presumably that's why Bob Ellis was outside chewing the fat with all of his admirers. So anyway, a little bit convoluted, but that's where we were. So we're talking about Obama. Now, so what I want to do now is I want to show you a video clip. This is in the 2012 campaign of Barack Obama starting off his campaign four months out from the November election. And I think it's important that we just have a look at how Obama looked and how he talked, remembering he's four years in, they've already caught bin Laden. And for mine, I'd already given up on, bin Laden, on, on not bin Laden, on Obama, realizing that there was no real hope. It was more of a nope. There was no real revolution because Obama had come out and said he preferred incrementalism. There it was. We weren't going to get the radical change that we looked for and what we needed and what we expected to get from the man who was, in Bob Ellis's words, the greatest orator in history. Let's take a look at that clip now. Over the next four months, you have a choice to make. Not just between two political parties or even two people. It's a choice between two very different plans for our country. Governor Romney's plan would cut taxes for the folks at the very top, roll back regulations on big banks, and he says that if we do, our economy will grow and everyone will benefit. But you know what? We tried that top-down approach. It's what caused the mess in the first place. I believe the only way to create an economy built to last is to strengthen the middle class asking the wealthy to pay a little more so we can pay down our debt in a balanced way, so that we can afford to invest in education, manufacturing, and homegrown American energy for good middle-class jobs. Sometimes politics can seem very small, but the choice you face, it couldn't be bigger. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. It was almost impossible not to like Obama. And if you didn't like Obama, or maybe you didn't believe Obama, but many of us did and thought, well, what are our options? And of course, Mitt Romney, who's turned out to be a rhino, was soundly defeated by Obama. And of course, Obama went from strength to strength. Now, here's where it starts to get interesting. We're going to go back to the Bob Ellis story. So this is Bob Ellis. Now, Fallen Heroes is part of what we're talking about today. This is what blew my mind when I saw this headline appear after Bob Ellis passed away. Bob Ellis and the underage brothel without payment. Most people on the left are not entirely disgusting. Some are very nice. And then there are the likes of the late Bob Ellis, Labor speechwriter and total toxic load. That article was written in June 10 of 2018 and was published in the Daily Telegraph. Well, the plot thickens. Let me show you another headline. This one, also in the Daily Telegraph, written by a different journalist, says Australian arts luminaries used girls for sex report. Predatory sexual behaviour in Australia's arts community included literary figures and famous artists for whom prepubescent sisters were 
Jailbait. It was only written the day after, on June 11, 2018, and does name Bob Ellis and some other people, all of whom had died by that point. This is the interesting part of the story. Now, I will include links to these articles in the comments where you'll see them for those that are interested in more information. Okay, so I've shown you two articles in the Daily Telegraph owned by Rupert Murdoch and considered to be right-wing news. Well, let's flick the switch now and go all the way to the left and see what they were talking about. This is the headline from The Guardian, published more than six years ago, also in 2018. Bob Ellis, what do you do when a literary hero is accused of sexual abuse? Rosanna and Kate Lilly's account of childhood sexual abuse by famous guests prompts a rethink of the era of free love. All right, so it appears that Bob Ellis was a notorious pedophile who had a little organised situation where he was able to get his jollies off, if you will. And of course, Bob Ellis went on to defend pedophilia in ways that I'll let you, the watcher, uh, the reader, easily discover when you start digging deep on this story. And I will provide links for all of those articles that I've just presented in the comments section there. I may even form a Substack article and put it all together for you. And you can find my Substack at jasonqcitizen at substack.com. Now, here we go. This is where it goes a bit further. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a video clip of Patrick Bet David, a recent one. And of course, most people will know that Patrick Bet David was a huge Trump supporter, gave an incredible interview in the week leading up to the election with Piers Morgan. Here he is discussing, well, what many of you would know who've been following the 17th letter of the alphabet. Let's have a look at Patrick Bet David catching up and talking about what he's now aware of. Never seen Obama this miserable, <laughs> this unhappy, uh, and it's not even anxious. He, he looked... He, he looked like he was worried that the world is going to find out something weird. By the way, today I got a very weird minect from a guy who says, hey, I just want to tell you what I think is going to be happening. I said, what's that? I don't know if it's true or not. Okay. He says, I think there's going to be a lot of people taking their lives. I said, what? Mm -hmm. He said, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are in there the last four years mm. that they know they're going to be exposed and you're going to see a few suicides. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, by the way, that thought has never crossed me my neither. mind until he sent me this minute this morning yeah. and I'm responding to it. That's awful. And I said, why, why, why are you, where are you going with this? So he's saying, look, if, if the truth comes out of what they did and who was involved the last four years, that becomes public. How do you face your wife? By the way, this is kind of like what people did in the stock market a day after 9-11. How many people were jumping off? Yep. You saw that. They're like, oh my God, it's money. You lost everything, yeah. right? Here, if any of these guys, the look they gave, when I watched some of their faces, it was a look of somebody that's worried about something being exposed to the world and their legacies being affected and their kids, family, everybody who ever supported them, knowing you did something dark. Really interesting, isn't it? That Patrick Bet David, billionaire businessman, brilliant podcaster, and uh, huge viewership is starting to make the connections that many of us knew way back in 2017. In fact, it was probably more like 2016 when people got onto the chance and first of all discovered a character called FBI Anon who indicated about uh, what was really going on behind the scenes and asked you to dig into human trafficking that said it went all the way to the top. That means that it was well known within the three-letter agencies, the FBI, way back in 2016. So therefore, it can't ever be construed that the man who got briefings when he became a presidential candidate would be now using this as some form of revenge. Rather, what he has done, and this is what it's all been about exposure, is let them play out what they were going to do and introduce lawfare and take your best shot, because when push comes to shove, the roles will be reversed. So as we're watching and seeing who will be in Trump's cabinet, 
it's interesting that Kash Patel would appear on Benny Johnson's podcast. And this is a headline that was taken from that particular interview. Breaking, Trump aide Kash Patel calls for massive declassification from Trump's administration, including the Epstein list and the Diddy list. I find it fascinating that all of this is coming together like some sort of jigsaw puzzle. So let's look at that now as to what we've just seen. So we've seen Obama looking as good as he ever did in 2012, despite being a disappointment. We saw Patrick Bet David delivering some really interesting information about some very, very dark secrets. And now let's go and have a look at what he was talking about, about the way that Barack Obama called by Bob Ellis in 2007 to my face, an Australian speechwriter for prime ministers such as Gough Whitlam, Bob Hawke, for Kim Beasley and others, including Kevin Rudd, so amply qualified, who said Obama gave the best speech that was 17 times better than the Gettysburg Address, calling him the greatest orator of our time, was or is Obama still the greatest orator of our time? Let's have a look at him. Only a matter of really a couple of, well, a few days or weeks ago. Strength is about working hard and carrying a heavy load without complaining. Real strength is about taking responsibility for your actions and telling the truth even when it's inconvenient. Real strength is about helping people who need it and standing up for those who can't always stand up for themselves. That is what we should want for our daughters and for our sons. And that is what I want to see in a president of the United States of America. And the good news is that you have candidates to vote for in this election that demonstrate that kind of character, who know what real strength looks like, who will set a good example and do the right thing and lead this country better than they found it. So, Pennsylvania, that is the choice in this election. It's not just about policies that are on the ballot. It is about values. And it is about character. So whether this election is making you feel excited, or scared, or hopeful, or frustrated, or anything in between, do not just sit back and hope for the best. Get off your couch and vote. Put down your phone and vote. Grab your friends and family and vote. Vote for Kamala Harris as the next president of the United States. Vote for Tim Walls as the next vice president of the United States. Was that really the greatest orator in history? J.D. Vance already is a better orator than whatever that was from Barack Obama. That is a massive decline. And Patrick Bed David has seen something and called it from an outsider's perspective, watching in, simply watching the facts of the day and the facts of the moment and the information that comes. So whilst many of us were well aware of what was happening a very, very long time ago, perhaps even as long as a decade, about in this particular cycle that's going on in what is now Trump's America, we're watching and seeing the, the, the catching up, if you will, from even the smartest guys in the room. Barack Obama has aged terribly during his presidency. And as you saw in 2012, he still looked like a young man. By 2016, he'd aged but by 2024, 12 years later, and the man is still only 64 years of age. Goodness me, Sidney Poitier looked amazing in his 80s. Denzel Washington still looks like a young man. Obama looks horrific. So what are we watching? Well, here's the punchline of the story. Here it is. This popped up today. Of course, it is just speculation, but it comes with a really big question behind it. Check it out. Patriot Voice or TPV John, this looks like it's come off Telegram and was shared on social media. Still no sign of life from Joe Biden. Now, we've heard this all the time and Joe Biden came out on Election Day, etc. But here's the point. There is a mandatory call with all White House staff being held at 10 a.m. today with Jeff Zentz, the Chief of Staff, followed by a call from all political appointments at 11 a.m. It sounds like we're getting ready to get a full resignation from Biden. 
and that he'll not be able to finish out his term. This is what I expect. I'm just going to say it. Biden is either terminal or dead. Something is really off wild times. My point is, what happens if a sitting president who loses the election, Biden, although it was Kamala Harris, this is why it gets even more meaty and interesting. What happens if Biden were to die in office between now and the inauguration? So Kamala Harris loses the election, but she's the vice president. Could she or will she or is it actually the case that she would then be inaugurated as the 47th president of the United States in this short window before Donald Trump is, first of all, um, endorsed by the uh, Electoral College and then goes on to be inaugurated in late January? These are fascinating times. I just think what we're seeing is way, way not over yet. And if Kamala Harris were to become the 47th president of the United States because of Biden resigning or dying in office, and of course, just speculation, then what would happen with all of these promises that we've seen that Putin wants to negotiate, Zelensky wants to negotiate, the Houthis want a ceasefire, Hamas wants a ceasefire, will all that turn around again or will it escalate and will we actually get to see the Project Blue Beam that's been speculated on way back to 2017? Absolutely riveting. Now, I just want to end today's bulletin simply, or it's really just a story. I just want to end today with a photograph of what is my all-time favourite of the man elected to be the 47th President of the United States, who may well be the 48th President of the United States. I just love this image. Just incredible. That was taken at Mar-a-Lago, and this is a man well before the lawfare had begun, or perhaps it had already begun because he was suffering all the way through his presidency. Cool, calm, collected, and a man totally, totally in control. What a time to be alive. What an incredible moment, what we have seen, history in the making. Donald Trump already would have to be the greatest politician in history, simply for surviving what he survived against the greatest power ever seen in modern or all-time history. One man standing up against the juggernaut and defeating them, annihilating them at the ballot box without, well, except for that assassination attempt, without a single bullet being shot. This was the greatest second American revolution scenario playing out before our eyes that we could have ever hoped for. And seriously, it hasn't even yet begun. More power to you. Thank you for watching this short Sunday morning edition. I'm going to say goodbye. Have a wonderful time and keep your eyes on what's going on. This ain't over yet, but the pendulum has swung the right way the world will change and reform, not only for the better, for the absolute purpose of the reason that you and I were born for this moment. What a time to be alive.